Dear colleagues, uh, welcome to today's EACVI webinar on the role of CT in structural heart disease interventions, patient selection, procedural planning, follow-up. I am Dr. Pál Maurovic Horváth from the Heart and Vascular Center of the Samovets University in Budapest, Hungary. The aim of this webinar is to give you a better understanding of how CT help you and your daily practice in patient selection, intervention planning and follow-up. The lecture will be presented by Professor Mohamed Marwan from University Hospital in Langen, Germany. And at the end of this 60-minute live event, you will be able to understand how CT can help you to plan structural heart disease interventions, perform a precise aortic annulus assessment to choose the proper uh, prosthesis size, to assess vascular access routes for optimal transcathetic aortic valve implantation, and to understand novel technology, technologies uh, in structural heart disease interventions. This session is highly interactive and we strongly encourage you to actively participate by sending your questions, your comments at any time during the webinar through the chat. Uh, anything you need to know, just ask and we will provide tips and tricks for your daily clinical practice. First, uh, I will give you a short introduction, then we'll hand over to, to Professor Marvan. So let me start with the introduction uh, session. Uh, the prevalence of aortic stenosis has been estimated as a 0.4% in, uh, in the largest population-based study from the United States. It is very low, uh, it has a very low uh, prevalence before the age of 65 and increases steadily afterwards, 1.3% between the ages of 65 and 64, 74, and increases to 2.8% after the age of 75. The prognosis of aortic stenosis in the elderly, elderly is influenced by the associated comorbidities. Once symptoms occur, valve replacement is the only effective treatment and there are no known therapies to prevent disease progression. The one-year mortality is really high, actually it's more than 50% in this elderly uh, population. According to demographic forecasts, there will be a striking increase in population aging over the next 50 uh, years. Uh, as you appreciate from the figure, uh, by the year of 2050, there will be actually more than one-third of the population over the age of, of uh, 65. And because of the age and comorbidities of this elderly patient population, 30 or 60 percent of these patients are denied surgical aortic valve replacement due to the increased risk and, uh, and operational mortality. So what are the alternatives to surgical aortic valve replacement? And basically, the balloon aortic valvuloplasty is only a palliation, is basically a bridge to aortic valve replacement. The medical management is not really effective, so the only uh, real effective therapy we have today is the transcathetic aortic valve implantation or valve uh, replacement. The first replacement, uh, the transcathetic aortic valve replacement was performed in 2002 by Professor Cribier. Uh, this was the first in human TAVI procedure using an anti-grade access approach via the femoral vein, crossing the intraatrial septum after the puncture and passing the native aortic valve in the direction of the blood flow. The prosthetic uh, valve basically consisted of, th of the bovine pericardial leaflets mounted on uh, a tubular st uh, stent-like uh, steel uh, structure and it was a balloon expandable uh, design. So the state-of-the-art prosthetic valves, uh, we have currently two main types. One is the balloon expandable stent and the other one is, this, uh, is the uh, self-expanding uh, uh, design. And the, the main structure in the most important structure, as you will learn from, from Mohammed, is basically the annulus. The transcathetic valve prothesis are anchored in this annulus, and that's why it is extremely important to have a proper, uh, proper planning, because the implanting physician does not have a uh, direct view on the aortic valve as opposed to the surgical aortic valve replacement. So what happens during the implantation? During the implantation, the TAVI basically displaces the, the native aortic valves and pushes the cups to, uh, towards the aortic valve. And with this, I would like to hand over uh, to Mohamed. So Mohamed, please. Uh, thank you, Paul, very much. Um, my name is Mohamed Marwan. I'm from uh, cardiology department, University Hospital Erlangen, and I warm welcome from my side as well. 
I encourage you, as well as Paul just previously mentioned, to share your thoughts and send your questions um, through the sh uh, chat. We have time to discuss um, relevant issues, and um, I hope it be um, interactive, um, as it should be. So um, CT um, has um, um, established a very good place in modern intervention in cardiology. We have um, a, a vast technology um, within the intervention and cardiology um, 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 spectrum of, cardi of uh, different devices for valvular and uh, chamber interventions. And there are certain aspects that are um, very important or advantages that make CT in this context um, very useful. It offers high spatial resolution, which translates into accurate image quality. This is very important as far as sizing, looking at anatomy, and um, giving um, de decisions for um, uh, different interventional procedures. High temporary resolution is a very important aspect as well. We have um, the heart, which is a structure in continuous motion. So in order to get those images with a high quality, you need to have high temporary resolution. Of course, you CT delivers volumetric, um, true volumetric information, um, which is very um, um, helpful in this context. As Paul previously mentioned, aortic stenosis is a relevant issue, and I think as far as CT for guiding structural heart uh, interventions is concerned, um, for planning TAVI procedures now in 2017, it is an established or the established imaging modality for looking at anatomy um, um, uh, before going through the TAVI procedure. Now, we um, why has CT established itself as sort of the, the preferred imaging modality for looking at um, anatomy prior to TAVI? We can see here in this image um, the volume of information that needs to be covered um, with CT. We need to look at the aortic root to have the heart uh, so that we can decide if the TAVI procedure is at all possible to have detailed information of the aortic root. But beyond that, we need to cover the iliofemoral axis as well to have um, the decision transfemoral approach versus non-transfemoral non approach. For CT imaging, certain aspects that have been um, just mentioned, high spatial resolution, accurate images, isotropic resolution, a very important point, um, especially in this patient uh, population, is the large volume um, that could be acquired in short time. And this is relevant, especially if you look at the TAVI cohort, which is an elderly cohort that could not could not stay in the scanner for long times, uh, could not hold their breath for long times. So it's very relevant to have an imaging modality that is realistic within this um, context. It is widely available, and I think um, compared to other um, imaging modalities, for example, MR, it is easy to perform and read. So these are advantages that make CT um, um, very helpful in the context of TAVI. We know these images, these 3D images, which are nice to see, but actually for the actual real reporting, we use the grayscale images for looking at the peripheral axis for the decision which route should be adopted and for looking, of course, on the aortic route and the aortic annulus. So what kind of information are we asking from CT? What do you need to report? What do you need to have uh, in the report? We need to have a look at the axis vessels, to have a look at the aortic root anatomy, the geometry, and to size the annulus to see if the procedure is at all possible or not. Um, the fluoroscopic orientation that would be suitable for implantation, especially for balloon expandable processes, is a piece of information that can be for free provided by CT. And in certain cases, in the context of follow-up, CT would be also helpful. So these are the topics that we will be um, covering as far as CT for TAVI um, planning is concerned. We we'll start by the axis vessels, and I, there are three things to look for when looking at the axles. Uh, on the axis vessels, we have to look at the diameter of the peripheral vessels. So, do the peripheral vessels have enough or provide enough lumen to go with the device upwards up to the aortic root? This is one piece of information. Torsuosity is sometimes an issue, and we'll see that in the next slides. And um, of course, um, a very careful look at classifications, which is quite predominant in this population. So these are the three things that have to be covered. If we look at the diameter, we have to keep in mind uh, which, for each vendor, there are certain minimal luminal diameters that are required for the different procedures. So we have to know which procedures we are planning to use and accordingly have the minimal luminal diameter and accordingly would report transfemoral as possible, yes, no, and if possible, which side of the patient left limb, right limb, or um, uh, would be preferred. So this is um, one uh, piece of information. And if we are reporting on diameters, which is for radiologists intuitively um, a clear fact, but maybe for cardiologists who are not dealing with peripheral vessels every day, it is important if we are doing 
cross-sectional measurements to have strictly orthogonal measurements. So if you have here this um, um, femoral artery, uh, external iliac artery, we have to have strictly orthogonal cross-sections here in that. We have a circular cross-section and then we do our measurements. So this is one important aspect. In order to not, not to overestimate the minimal luminal diameters, you have to have strictly orthogonal cross-sections. Now moving on to tortuosity, which is also not very uncommon in this elderly population. This is an image of an elderly lady. We can see here in the 3D images a number of 90 degrees bends. And if we look on the grayscale images, we can see those bends as well, and it's clearly non-calcified anatomy. And intervention, a cardiologist know, using the interventional material, we have the stiff wires and with the sheath, such non-calcified tortuosities are not a problem. They get stretched out. What is problematic or sometimes problematic and sometimes not very easy to depict or to estimate in thin slice images are calcified tortuous segments. So we see here this is the left side of, um, of um, a bend and you can see exactly at the place of the bend here you have calcium and this might cause problems. And with this I want to show you one example. This is another um, lady who has been referred for a TAVI procedure. Um, so this is the right side and we have here the cross section here that will be shown in this image. So this is the cross or the image or the grayscale images of the right limb and you can see here there is much calcium at that point and those lines here are used to provide a cross section which is this and clearly without doing any measurements there is so much calcium, the lumen is so small so the right side of the limb, the right side of this patient does not come into question as far as the transfemoral approach is concerned. Now looking at the left side, I will zoom in a little bit, you have here this tortuosity, so we have here this kink and there is calcium on this side on the other side, and this is how it looks like, exactly um, as we see here, there's calcium on this side and the other side, and during the procedure, so we have here the wire, that they are trying to pull the procedure, the procedure upwards, and you can see the sheath is um, um, skinked here, so this is exactly where the calcium is, and with some luck, and with some maneuvers, they manage to um, stretch this kink, this calcified kink. In an unlucky situation, if there's extremely calcified, you might not be able to move forwards to the root, aortic root, or in, in, um, um, in an unpleasant case, this can lead to vascular complications, which are sometimes then fatal. So calcified tortuosities are very problematic, and these are the ob obstacles for transfemoral access. If you have small diameter vessels, so vessels are, that are not big enough to accommodate the device, calcified tortuous bends, and also circular calcifications because a certain degree of flexibility is expected from the femoral vessels. So if you have a vessel that is exactly at the border to allow the device, let's say the device needs six millimeters, the vessel is exactly six millimeters and is circularly calcified, this might also be problematic. Now, we don't only um, look at the iliofemoral vessels. Mohamed, yes, please. Sorry, because before we go and continue with the aorta, so we got a couple of questions regarding patient preparation and radiation dose. So um, the colleagues are interested in uh, what is more important in this patient population, basically the radiation, since we do basically whole body imaging here, or the, or the contrast amount. So that was one question. The other question was, why don't we use... Um, ultrasound uh, to, to image the peripheral arteries instead of uh, CT, so because of radiation issues again. And then we received an, uh, a third question regarding the radiation dose. What amount of radiation a patient receives from 3D CT imaging during structural heart, in, heart intervention? Okay. So I'll start with the radiation issue, which is generally an aspect for cardiac CT, but I think in the context of TAVI patients, it is not a high priority. So these are, we're talking about patients that in most of the registries we have a mean age of around 80 years, so radiation is not really the topic. How much radiation does a patient get from CT? This is a difficult question because it really depends on what kind of, of equipment, hardware do you have um, in your institution. If you have a high-end scanner, then you end up with such images covering up from the aortic arch or from the subclavian um, vessels down to the puncture sites, you can go um, um, something between uh, two to five millisieverts, covering all this entire volume. Um, um, so the radiation is very much dependent on how, what kind of equipment we have. If you have a very old scanner, 64 slices less, you will need to do those in two 
um, scans. So one scan that will cover the heart and the other scan will cover the peripheries because otherwise you'll be giving too much contrast. And so, sorry, if, so if you have a state of the scanner, so you do the whole body imaging with gated scan or uh, you do the, the, the chest part gated and ungated the abdominal portion? What is your strategy? So if we have um, a high-end scanner, we would do both in um, ECG gated mode. So the, the op, because the wider detectors, the fast um, uh, gantry rotation will allow us without much contrast to perform that. Um, you have to tailor the examination according to the um, um, scanner you have to get the best images with the least rotation and the least volume of contrast. So this is as far as radiation is concerned. I would, looking at uh, vessels with ultrasound, the question with ultrasound is, are the vessels um, um, high grade, um, have high grade stenosis, or yes or no? But the rest of the anatomy, how much calcifications cannot be seen in ultrasound? So I think this is um, um, the amount of information delivered by CT is extremely helpful to tell you, should we go transfemoral, and if yes, which side? And this would definitely be not comparable. Uh, the three-dimensional information and the information about the calcium is not comparable to ultrasound. Now, regarding the contrast issue, so these are elderly uh, patients, fragile patients, uh, sometimes, or not sometimes, quite often with kidney disease. So uh, what is the contrast amount needed to, to really image the whole aorta and the, and the access uh, points as well? Again, um, the contrast amount is very much dependent on the scanner. So um, we can go down with the contrast amount for such images down to 30, 40 millis for both scans, for the heart and for the periphery. But this, these are um, um, contrast volumes that are only doable in, um, uh, in a setting with a high-end scanner. Of course, most of those TAVI patients, I would say felt, without any statistics, like 60% would have some degree of renal impairment. Not to mention that it is not uncommon in a clinical setting that they would just come through the emergency room, decompensated through the heart failure, they would get diuretic treatment. So they might end up with a little bit of uh, pre-renal um, impairment as well. Um, so we have to be very, very careful f as far as contrast is concerned. But again, the amount of contrast you give during the CT, uh, whether this is the 40, 50 millis if you're using a high-end scanner, will provide very decisive information for the safety of the procedure, for the success of the procedure and it will save contrast later on during intervention, saving our orthographies, and we will talk about that later when talking about the fluoroscopic orientation, and um, uh, will provide decisive information as far as the safety and success of the procedure. So contrast is definitely an issue, um, but again, um, for patients with renal impairment, we see that they are um, um, recompensated, they get um, well hydrated the day before, and we try to reduce the contrast as much as possible. Yes, I, I think it's important to emphasize that this is an elderly patient population, so here the, the radiation dose is not a big issue. Not the major part. Yes, so, so yeah. I, I also agree that the, we have to really be careful how much contrast we, we give to these uh, yeah. patients. Yeah. And there are some other, some other tricks that can be used also for reducing contrast, like uh, using low KVs. Um, um, so the less the KV, the higher, the, the, the brighter the contrast is. So we can uh, do some tricks as well to try to reduce your contrast amount. We got a, a very technical question, so maybe we can just answer it. Um, um, what, what are the minimal technical parameters to perform pre tavi CT assessment? I think we partially touched this. Yes. But um, maybe you know we can give some technical details regarding. Uh, it definitely should be as. Uh, a fast scanner, yes, with yes. a gantry rotation time. Yes, I would, I would say cardiac CT, the minimum is a 64 slice yes. scanner. And if you have a 64 slice scanner, you are able to do pre tavi CTs. But in this case, you will, one point, and I think um, we have to um, um, be strict about that, everybody should know that aortic root imaging should be ECG gated. Even if it costs you more contrast, if it costs you more time, aortic root imaging, is ECG gated. So in a 64 slice CT setting, scanner setting, you will need an ECG gated for the heart. And I would advise to do the rest for looking at the peripheries, just, just like colleagues from radiology would do non-ECG gated for the peripheries because they, the vessels would not move that much. Yes. So the most important point, how you change the acquisition, what to do without going into technical details that are a little bit beyond the webinar, you have to have ECG gating for the water route. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we've talked about um, the axis. We look at the iliofemoral axis, but of course, we look at the rest of the anatomy, so we have a look at the aorta, some uh, other findings, infrared and aneurysms, and this was one case 
we had a subclavian stand here protruding very much into the aortic um, uh, arch. And in this case, going up with a big device through this would definitely um, um, cause some damage to the subclavian stand. So this is kind of information you can easily see um, by looking at the rest of the anatomy. And for further non, uh, for other non-transfemoral um, approaches, for the trans-aortic approach, easy, uh, you can get information about the position of the aorta, distance from the sternum, and our surgeons, um, our, our preferred non transfemoral approach is the transapical axis, and they like to look at the position of the apex within the chest um, um, cavity. So you see this is one kind of apex here, so the incision, the apical incision for uh, the transapical root will be quite different than horizontal anatomy like in this patient. Uh, so this is kind of information you get um, uh, from CT, and to um, summarize the axis points, if you're looking at cross-sectional measurements, you have to be very strict about about putting the lines orthogonal to the vessel axis. The required lumen diameter depends on the vendor you're using, on the planned prosthesis, and accordingly you decide on the, um, uh, whether it is possible or not. Torsoasis are not problematic if they are non-calcified. It's quite common. Torsoasis in presence of calcium might be problematic and might be difficult to assess in thin slice images. And circular calcifications in borderline anatomy is, um, 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 could also be problematic and just take a couple of minutes looking at the aortic lumen and the rest of the anatomy. So the second um, um, aspect after looking at the axis vessels, of course, is looking at the aortic root anatomy, geometry, and have a look on the annulus size uh, to decide on the prosthesis. Um, a very nice thing about CT that it gives you the aortic analyst in relation to important neighbors, in this case the coronary arteries. How far are the coronaries? How do the leaflets look like? We know in surgical valve replacement the surgeons would debulk the leaflets. These cal this calcified leaflets will go away, so this is not an issue, but in transcatheter interventions the idea is to put the valve within the, um, within the annulus and these would be pressed into the neighboring structures. So in such anatomy, which is not very common, but it happens, so this was an elderly patient, you can see here, uh, this is the left leaflet, um, severely calcified, this is the left main, a very short distance, and the fear is, or the risk is, is during intervention these would be pushed upwards and would cause coronary obstruction or left main compromise. So this is an important um, anatomical aspect that is easily depicted in CT and um, I think it was a common discussion, so which distance should be thought of as a safe distance uh, to perform TAVI. So 10 millimeters was a common uh, measurement and um, this was one case if you measure the distance here, so this is the annulus plane, um, this is the left main, and you see the distance is 14 millimeters. The valve was implanted, the patient was hemodynamically not doing very well, and you can see here the selective angiography shows in this patient that the left main ostium shows compromised by this calcium here. If you have a second look on this anatomy again, indeed the distance from the annulus to the left main is 14 millimeters, but the leaflet itself is 16 millimeters. There is heavy calcifications, especially on the tip, which is if any coronary obstruction would occur, it would occur in this anatomy. Um, calcifications that are on the base are not problematic, but those on the tip, especially if they are huge as this case, um, would be a problem. So the patient had um, left main stenting and um, everything went fine. I'll move forward to the next slide. And, um, and he survived the procedure. But if you decide on doing a TAVI in such anatomical um, 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 uh, considerations, you have to be aware of the fact that coronary obstruction is a risk, and some um, 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 uh, interventions would even consider not doing it, um, not doing a TAVI in such anatomies. Um, there are also um, scientific data as far as the risk for coronary obstruction is concerned. Um, uh, this is an older study from John Webb's group, from Jonathan Leipzig from 2013, looking at a um, group of patients, controls, uh, 345 patients without coronary obstruction and 28 patients with coronary obstructions. And if we draw this line along the 10 millimeters distance, we can see that most of the obstructions occurred when the distance is below 10 millimeters, but indeed, just like in this case, some obstructions did occur even up to values of 16 millimeters. So distances, absolute numbers, is not really the, 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 the only consideration. There are other important considerations like the length and calcification of the cusp, shallow versus deep sinus, like in this case we have a relatively low distance, but deep sinus, so there is place to accommodate such leaflets. And I show you another case 
and this was an elderly patient we, that was referred to us from a nearby hospital, 90-year-old lady, living alone, still caring for herself, going for walks, severely symptomatic, and you see the anatomy here, um, uh, which is um, quite severe, lots of calcifications on the tip of the left leaflet, quite a short distance, and the first impression and the first actual decision back then was not to um, implant this lady. The surgeons, and we can understand that, um, um, refused the patient, and after having a second look at this data set, the left main in this lady is advantage advantageous in the sense that the left main is quite big. It's an ectatic left main, something around one centimeter left main. So uh, the idea was probably this calcium will go a little bit into um, the left main, but would be not um, um, not relevant for the lady. So the patient, we did still went for implantation, and you can see here the orthography. Exactly as you see in the CT, the calcium is a lot. The distance is short, but the left main is big. And after implantation, everything went fine. We did a selective angiography and even IVUS of this left main ostium, which uh, was okay. So there are other considerations that have to be kept in mind when looking at risk for coronary obstruction, not only going for absolute distances. So we received a question regarding the coronaries. So do you actually report the coronaries on the on TAVI planning scan? Very rarely. So yesterday, Actually, we had a patient. You know, for TAVI patients, we usually we, or we don't give nitrates. For a coronary cardiac CT, the usual is we give beta blockers, we give nitrates, and then we scan the patients. For TAVI, nitrates should not be given to high-grade aortic stenosis, and this is relevant for image quality. But sometimes, in patients that don't have that much calcium, we're talking about very elderly population, if you can adequately assess the coronaries, then it's enough to, um, to go directly to intervention. But how often is that? It is quite unoften. Very often we have severe calcifications, stents, bypass patients, and um, it's, it, we, in our institution the standard is invasive coronary angiography, and if we happen to, uh, by chance, get the coronaries, we, we, we report them. Is, is it actually a standard procedure, the, the wire, the high-risk coronary? So if you see such a big bulk of calcium you just showed us, if, if you see that and a very shallow sinus, so is it a standard practice, the wire, the coronaries before the intervention? So in, ca in case something bad happens, you, you already know where is the orifice? I think a lot of interventionists would do that. We have always this we discussion when we, we have a number of courses, um, TAVI courses a year. A lot of interventionists would feel more comfortable putting a wire into the left main if they feel that the anatomy is so we don't do that we might we may be made like three um, or four cases planned cases where we thought that there's risk of obstruction what we do is we plan a PCI set the team is prepared but we don't usually put a wire um, but I think this is um, there's no right and wrong this is a, uh, it's a matter of taste yes uh I think uh, we, will, we will discuss that, but actually there are several questions regarding the phase. So which phase? Uh, here we have a question that, okay, so at which part of the cardiac cycle are the CT measurements of the aorta performed? Yes, so this is a good question. Um, um, there has been a couple of years ago lots of scientific discussions, but actually the current recommendations is to perform systolic um, measurements. The idea is that the aortic root or aortic anal analyst shows a certain degree of dynamism, so there are some confirmation changes in the analyst during the cardiac cycle. So it should uh, be performed in systole because the measurements are a little bit bigger and there are certain studies, retrospective measurements, that found out that if they had, if they had performed the measurements in diastole in 50% of the cases, the measurement would have been different. Uh, the the prosthesis recommendation would have been different. Which phase? Um, around 20% of the cardiac cycle. I personally do that in milliseconds because commonly patients have atrial yeah. fibrillation, elderly population with atrial fibrillation. So with milliseconds, with absolute delay reconstruction, we quite know when exactly do we, do we reconstruct after the R wave. So I measure in, after, in 200 milliseconds after the R wave. Yes, uh, it's very important actually because if you, if you just compare these two numbers, so it's, a, it's a big number of patients who would receive a different size of prosthesis yes. just based on when mm -hmm. we perform the measurement, systole or diastole. So the, the recommendation is to perform it in, 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 early in, in, in early systole. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I, um, I think we can move forward. So we discussed the um, um, aortic root anatomy as far as the coronaries are concerned. And of course, an important aspect is um, annular dimensions. We have to have very accurate sizing. If the process is too large, 
it theoretically can lead to incomplete expansion of the prosthesis, which could be dysfunctional. So this is not really the issue, but the fear is, of course, is to have a prosthesis that is too large that will end up with annular complication, which in most of the cases is fatal uh, with high morbidity and, of course, mortality. The second aspect is if the prosthesis is too small, there has been reports of prosthesis embolization. And, of course, the clinically relevant complication or um, uh, part is to have paravalvular regurgitation, which has been clearly shown to have a poor outcome. So exact analyst sizing is important. How to do that? I think the most important step for me through the awartic um, root assessment in CT is to find the right plane. We cardiologists have learned a lot about aortic root and aortic analysis through the TAVI um, um, learning curve. And the image plane needs to be exactly aligned with the aortic analyst. The aortic analyst is not an anatomical structure. It is a virtual ring. If you can see at this um, schematic presentation here, the red um, 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 depicted uh, structures, these are the leaflets or cusps. And we see the green ring down there. It's a virtual ring that is connecting the cusp and insertion points together. So this, as the cusps or the leaflets touch the ventricle, these are the cusp insertion points. And the virtual ring connecting them is the aortic analysis. How to do that? Different ways, different, um, 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 different approaches. But just before we go to annular plane adjustment, I want to mention one point which has been thoroughly and commonly discussed. So if you look at this image here, this is a sort of a coronal image of the aortic root and the left ventricle. The dashed lines represent this image here, which shows the aortic analysis. So we have here, those are the cusp insertion points, just touching the ventricle. And if you perform 2D TEE, which was actually what we've always done, if we look at the aortic analyst pre-surgical procedures, you will be, you will have your TEE probe here somewhere behind the left atrium in the esophagus, and the TEE will show you this axis or this um, dimension of the aortic analyst. Where in most of the cases, when often that the aortic analyst is oval, so you miss the second dimension, which is in, um, which is which is larger. So this is the discrepancy between. 3D information delivered by CT and 2D information delivered by TEE. So that's why CT measures a little bit more. So there's this discrepancy which ends up with different um, sizing. So how to determine analyst plane by CT? Different ways, different software. I won't get into details. What we do is a basic manual way using the workstation. So the first thing is we identify the lowermost point of the right coronary cusp. So this is here the right ventricle, this is the left um, interatrial septum, this is the left atrium part of it. It's zoomed in to show you the analyst. This is the right cusp insertion point. We find this, then we look for the non-coronary cusp insertion point, and then we look for the left coronary cusp. And this is the aortic analyst, as easy as it is. I would like to show you, without going into measurement details, how to do that, um, um, or how we do that in our institution. So this is how a CT would be displayed in any workstation or in software. We have here three windows. So we have here the axial sections, we have here the sagittal sections, and here the coronal sections. We have here the aortic valve. I will just put my reference lines there. And the first step is to have a rough cross-section of the valve. So we have to rotate this line here. So now we have a rough cross-section of the valve by this red image, which I will enlarge a little bit, maybe zoom in a little bit, and this is the aortic valve. So this is the right side with no contrast or maybe a faint a bit of contrast. This is the left atrium. This is the left atrial appendage. This is the interatrial septum. And you can see the three leaflets of the aortic valve, the right cusp, the non-coronary cusp, and the left coronary cusp. The first thing is to um, find the right cusp insertion point. So I scroll downwards. I'm moving towards the ventricle. So we see here this the cusp did not really disappear almost about to disappear, and here the cusp touches the ventricle. So I put the reference lines on this point, and this is the first right cusp insertion point. Now we fix them there, and we have two planes here, the two planes where we have to rotate the planes to get the other two cusps in orientation. I rotate here with this line, and you can see the non-coronary cusp here, and I go backwards. So the non-coronary cusp disappears at this point, so this is the cusp insertion point of the non-coronary cusp. I join them together with the, this line. And now we o we're only left to have the left coronary cusp with the last plane that we did not change. So we go upwards, it gets bigger, and then go downwards. And this is a plane nicely adjusted in a quick way to have the three cusp insertion point, right, non-coronary, and left in the same plane. 
I just scroll upwards and scroll downwards and make sure that they are all disappearing at the same time. And this is sort of the proof that you are in the right plane. This is very important. How to do that? The different ways to start with bridge cusp insertion, but you just have to end in the right plane. Moment before we continue, we, we got a lot of questions, so I tried to select some of them, which, which I found really interesting. So, um, do you need a special software to measure the annulus uh, and plan TAVI procedure? You don't have to have a software. You can have a software. We use the manual. It's a simple workstation. What you have to keep in mind is you have to have the reference lines always crossed at 90 degrees. So this is an aspect that has to be available. Otherwise, in which way you do it, whether with software or with the workstation, it is, um, um, uh, doesn't play a role. My advice is, if you're using software, you just have to put your input. Don't just re completely rely on a software that will spit out the entire um, annulus measurements without any, any, um, any um, uh, corrections, because in some patients, even if it's not very common, with like impaired image quality, obese patients, patients who might breathe a little bit, the software will find it difficult to find the right plane, even if it works fine in most of the cases. What we do, I do the, use the simple basic workstation and measure the analyst um, uh, with it. Um, I think we have time for two quick questions in this part, and I'm sure we will have many more. Uh, so, are the coronary anomalies considered a contraindication for this procedure? So. Um, the colleague also gives an example, so left coronary artery arising of the right coronary sinus. So no. is, is it a contraindication? Yeah, actually, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting and nice question, and it's sometimes funny to just sit down, look at a TAVI CT, because yeah. as looking at coronary anomalies for coronary CTs, there's always discussion, so how malignant are these anomalies? And the proof that they are not malignant is a 90-year-old lady that is coming for a TAVI intervention with such a coronary anomaly. So I think the issue is, if there is some risk of obstruction, then of course it is more um, 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 uh, more important if it's like a single coronary artery yes. or a left coming from right. So this is the only aspect that is, um, I think it's um, interesting. But otherwise you, they will be dealt with just like a, like a normal TAVI CT. And somebody is asking regarding the, I think this is, this question is regarding the valve in valve procedure. Yes. So do you have experience with that? Yes. So the valve in valve CT answers two questions. The peripheries, are they wide enough to get transfemoral, yes or no? And the coronaries. The sizing, we actually know from the, 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 what kind of procedure is in. Actually, there are so, certain applications um, on like smartphones that will provide you also recommendations. But I think the decisive part about looking at the CT for valve and valve is to see the coronary anatomy. In certain types of valves, like the mitral flow, serene valves, the, you get um, an artificial uh, or the new analyst with the procedures. And they are sometimes very close to the ostia. And not only that, if the aortic root is shallow, so it is close and it's shallow, there might be the risk of coronary obstruction. So I think CT is very helpful for looking at this issue. Can we do valve and valve as far as coronary is concerned and peripheral vessels? Thank you. I, I think we have to continue. Uh, we have a lot of questions, so okay. I, will, I will stop you soon. Yeah, please interrupt me. If we have questions, we'll yes. do our best to, um, yes. uh, to cover them all. So we have now the analyst, and the question is how to size it. So we want to size this analyst. So this is a native analyst that is in, in often, or in a lot of cases, oval. And in most of the cases, it will turn into a certain degree of a circular structure after implantation. So how to size this anatomy? So there are three different methods of doing that. One way. I think I would say the easiest way is to measure the mean diameter. So if we have the structure here, we have here one dimension, and we have here the other dimension, and we get the mean diameter by adding them and dividing them by two. So this is, so this is one way of doing that, to measure the mean diameter. And you assume that the mean diameter before implantation is similar to the mean diameter after implantation, which is mathematically not completely correct. So this is one way of doing it. Measure the mean diameter, and assume that it is the same before and after implantation. The second way is to trace the area of the native aortic annulus. So you have um, an area. Out of this area, you can get an area derived diameter. And again, assume that this area before implantation will remain the same after implantation. So again, this is mathematically not entirely correct because if you have an oval structure, the area will not be the same as the circular structure. But for certain aspects, and I think we'll cover that in the next slide, the area derived diameter is sort of like the preferred way or the recommended way of sizing the aortic annulus to measure the area and get area derived diameter. Now the mathematical third way of sizing the annulus is to measure the circumference. 
the perimeter or the sort of the length of the aortic annulus. So if we can trace that, we can get the, uh, the perimeter. And again, out of this, we can get the perimeter derived diameter using this equation. So if you think of it, actually this is the measure, the way that would make most sense because the length or perimeter of the aortic annulus would be remain would remain the same before and after implantation. But there are certain um, 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 issues about circumference measurements. If you see here this example, and it's a little bit exaggerated, just to give you the feeling how, why it is difficult. So if you have here the annulus, then you go rather than straight lines, you'll have a perimeter of 81 millimeters, which corresponds to a, perim uh, to a perimeter derived diameter of 25 millimeters. So this be would be one sizing. The same annulus, if you go into different if you take intercourse and duration, different anatomical details, you'll end up with a longer measurement and a much bigger diameter. So according to how much information you put, and every software has so-called like smoothing contours to avoid this problem, but there is a certain degree of inter on observer reproduce, um, um, variability and intra-observer variability. So circumference measurements are not um, um, actually required, similar to the question, how long is the cost of England? Depending on straight lines, every single bay, you get different measurements. And for that reason, circumference measurements are not recommended for, because of the um, inter-observer and intra-observer variabilities. So we have a number, we have the size of the analyst, which procedures to take. For every vendor, there is valves um, sizing specifications for different uh, procedures. And I think where CT also brings much uh, more information that is relevant for taking the decision which procedures to take. If you look at, for example, here the balloon expandable sapien, three procedures. Let's take a look at the 26 valves. So which areas are recommended? So for a, an area, for a native aortic annulus that goes from 430 to 546, you can use a 26 valve. And starting from 540 up to 680 something, you can go for a 929 valve. And these borderline areas are very interesting. Um, and the anatomical information you can get out of the CT can help you take the decision, OK, I will go for the bigger valve, or, or I would rather go for the smaller valve. So borderline um, anatomy is um, especially important um, or uh, uh, the help of CT. So, so, sorry to interrupt you. You just uh, mentioned the borderline lesion and uh, borderline annulus, and we have a question regarding that. So, what is your strategy, borderline annulus measurement? I think the fear of any intervention in cardiologists during the TAVI procedure is to cause any injury, which is related to um, anatomy, calcium, and um, um, we'll be touching on that uh, later. So, if I have a borderline anatomy or a borderline annulus with lots of calcification, then we would go for the smaller valve. If it's non-calcified whatsoever or like minimal calcifications, then I would tip the scale of the valve to the bigger ones. Again, you, put, you would put other considerations also into the decision. So a borderline analyst with heavy leaflets, calcifications, a borderline distance to the coronaries, rather go for the smaller one. Um, what to do then? Some, there are some many intervention, interventions with do some off-label um, 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 maneuvers like putting less volume in the balloon and so on and so forth. But I think the information out of the CT is how much calcium and how, does the, how tight does the anatomy look like and accordingly decide. And, and this question might be related to that as well. So what is the embolic stroke risk so of TAVI implantation basically? Yeah, it's, uh, so there was also this question, so valvular plus yes or no for the embolic risk, and this is something we, um, uh, we um, routinely do. The embolic risk, I think, as far as I remember, is something somewhere around uh, 2%. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So um, back to the information we report out of the CT. So we have a look in the access vessels, of course, the aortic route, and one piece of information that can nicely be predicted out of the CT, and it's for free, so it's information that is available for free and will definitely help later on during implantation is the fluoroscopic orientation. So for balloon, especially for balloon expandable processes, you would like or the implanter would like to have the right cusp in the middle of the, um, in the, middle of the, um, of the screen and the left and non-coronary cusp on the right and left to have a strict orthogonal view on the valve to adequately implant. So if you see here, after adjustment of the annulus, you can actually predict which view would give you this orthogonal and having the right cusp in the middle. So if you look from this direction, you're looking around this um, arrows here, you have the right cusp in the front, the, non the left and non-coronary cusp are um, on the left and right side, and this can be given 
Um, so this is the plane here, which provides this uh, view, and this can be shown here on the software, and you can give that to the cath lab for use during implantation. Any view looking from here, from there, from down there is orthogonal, but the implanters would like to have for the balloon, especially for balloon expander processes, the right cusp in the middle and the none and left symmetrically on both sides. And this saves a number of orthographies later on, so contrast is being saved by providing this information. So maybe one, and maybe we've touched on that um, in our discussion, so calcium is the enemy of cardiac CT anyways, for looking at the coronaries, it's an um, issue. And in the context of TAVI, for two issues, lots of calcium in the annular plane, the procedure will not adapt to the aortic wall properly and will predict regurgitation. And of course, such anatomy with heavy calcification, especially annular calcifications, extending beyond the aortic annulus to the, um, 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 to the surrounding structures is or have been associated with, with rupture. So this is one kind of anatomy that you can see in CT and it might, enter, might change your decision um, in different ways. So we uh, received, again, several questions. I I'm trying to select the ones which are really uh, related and, and very tightly related to the topic we're discussing today. So what is the um, uh, LVOT classification cutoff? Do, is, there, is there a cutoff at all? I don't think we'll get a cutoff because for me it's a pure visual assessment. Where is the, how much is the calcium? This is, of course, this can be quantifiable, but the problem is where is this calcium? Um, I think the, this is a visual impression. Which calcium would you feel to be um, relevant? And I think it's even more difficult because, you know, you perform a CT for one patient, you have this image. And then the question is, oh, this looks risky for, for aortic um, rupture. Should we do the TAVI, yes or no? And it's a very difficult answer because you cannot really predict how this calcium would behave. Sometimes they would, like, um, uh, crack at the right position, so the pressure is somehow relieved. Sometimes they would not crack. So the decision is very, is very difficult. So I don't think there's a cutoff exactly as I also believe there's no cutoff for coronary CTs. Um, it depends. If, there, if all the calcium is in one spot, it will make you issues. If it's distributed, it will probably not make you issues. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, so calcium is an issue for TAVIS, and with that, I think as far as the planning for procedure is concerned, I can, I can conclude that CT can provide a lot of information as far as access is concerned, coronary anatomy and risk of obstruction, analyst dimensions and sizing, and the orientation that would be suitable for implantation. We are gaining more experience, both with CT and with TAVI, and we are putting more confidence and um, um, using this information for guiding the procedure. Before leaving the TAVI um, arena, I think in the context of follow-up pa follow of patients with TAVI, CTs can also provide very useful information. So this is one um, example of um, an elderly patient with, um, with the issue we just discussed, lots of calcium here, some of it just extending here into the muscle a little bit down to the anterior mitral valve leaf. During implantation, he was a little bit for a short time hemodynamically impaired. Not sure if it projects quite well, but you might see a little bit of darkness here, so a little bit of contrast coming out here, and this is the post-implant CT. I th think a couple of uh, months later, you can see exactly where the calcium is here, so this is the exact orientation. We had a so-called concealed annular structure, so you can see here this is contrast coming out. The patient was lucky enough to have this contrast somehow contained, so he survived the procedure, and um, um, this is something you can see. CT is perfect for showing anatomy. What we have been seeing for the last couple of years, of course, reports about so-called TAVI leaflet thrombosis or leaflet thickening, um, sometimes subtle findings, sometimes clear findings, those um, dark st um, structures here on the leaflets. And um, this is the, least, uh, the latest publication, um, I think coming from Japan and published in Jack Imaging a couple of months ago um, for a cohort uh, around 70 patients. And you can see after, uh, just at discharge, we had, they had one patient with this finding, with the so-called hypo. Um, um, attenuation of the leaflets after um, uh, six months, they had more patients, six patients. After one year, they had um, um, three patients. So there, with time, it seems to increase, but the more Im most important clinical aspect is they had no clinical events. And maybe I will show you one case, one of the very few cases we had. So this was a patient with a, a classical TAVI constellation, 73-year-old ischemic cardiomyopathy, previous cavage who had a TAVI prosthesis. Um, in December 2014 and um, 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 had um, the follow-up in March. So the TAVI procedure looked fine, the gradient was okay, 16 to 9 millimeter mercury, he was asymptomatic. So this was in March and five, year, uh, five months later, 
the patient comes in the emergency room, he has angina at rest, he has stable ejection fraction, and there's um, um, a significant rise of the gradient over the valve. So you can see the gradient is around 44 to 25 millimeter mercury. You can see here in echo that there is something moving, but you can't really show or get the, the f details of the, uh, of the uh, valves. And I think this is a, uh, especially important why CT uh, or CT has been interesting in this aspect. And you can do, we did the CT for this patient and you can see here clearly that there are those thickenings here on the leaflets. Um, this is this gray stuff here. You have the impression that the right cusp or the right leaflet, which is here, this is the right ventricle, is um, uh, moving a little bit less. Um, and the patient was put on oral anticoagulation and one month later, they resolved, he was asymptomatic, and had a gradient of 16 to 9. This is very uncommon, but it sometimes, in very rare cases, um, uh, present with, um, with, uh, with, uh, with symptoms. Now we have other findings, like in this. So um, uh, this is not the greatest image quality, but you see the leaflet here is thickened. This is a patient that was completely asymptomatic on aspirin. The mean gradient was not high, um, or a little bit high. This is another patient. Um, um, or maybe the same, uh, no, this is the same patient after being put on oral anticoagulation. He's, a, he was asymptomatic, he's still asymptomatic, the gradient is a little bit uh, less, and the question is what to do with those patients. So I think the question is not really entirely answered, uh, we're still learning, but we know for sure that leaflet thickening and thrombosis is not infrequent. It mostly undergoes a subclinical course, it is less frequent in patient on oral anticoagulation we can see it in surgical and TAVI procedures, so it's not something related to TAVI, it's related to uh, prosthetic valves. And in patients with relevant gradient increase, they might be symptomatic, although it's quite uh, rare. And the optical treatment and the duration of oral anticoagulation is unclear. And the decision is definitely, uh, should be tailored according to the clinical assessment. So this is as far as CT for TAVI is concerned, and I think this is the main bulk um, uh, for guiding in structural heart disease interventions as aortic stenosis is a relevant issue and TAVI um, uh, procedures are gaining um, more uh, place in cardiology as just as Paul mentioned in the beginning but CT is not only restricted to TAVI procedures but also for guiding other interventions due to the fact that they provide volumetric um, information and um, um, with, good, um, uh, with very good image quality. So this is um, an example of a CT guided closure of a valvular leak that was a patient who had the biostatic aortic prosthesis with a significant amount of paravalvular regurgitation and, and um, um, exertion and dyspnea. The pressure half time is around 350. The ventricle was volume loaded. And um, um, of course, there are certain limitations for echocardiography as far as um, um, acoust um, acoustic shadowing, um, windowing, and you see the CT of this patient. You can see here the, the prosthesis is a bioprosthesis. These are the leaflets, and you see here this is the leak. So there's a contrast agent continuity between the ventricle and the aorta. And you can clearly and nicely tackle this area where you know or you see that this leak and you can uh, see here this is the leak exactly in cross section. You can use that for sizing. So this was five times eight millimeters. And you can also provide a strictly orthogonal view on the prosthesis that can be used in the cath lab for tackling this leak with the wire. So you look here strictly orthogonal on this leak and here in this case an RAO of 16 and codal of 6 was predicted to be a nice and an orthogonal view. You can nicely see here an orthogonal view of the prosthesis and with that view you can um, um, tackle this lesion, uh, this leak here and this was used the same angulation was used for the cath lab to pass through the leak and this patient had a PDA occluder um, uh, seven millimeters, and you can see that um, using um, stent enhancement, um, um, you can see then the PDA occluder sitting here um, uh, just uh, close to the valve, and of course you can use CT as well uh, for follow-up uh, for the position of the prosthesis um, um, uh, and the position of the, of the occluder. Last but not least, um, also in the context of structural heart disease interventions for left atrial appendage um, closure. Um, this was a 70-year-old patient with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, had a clear indication for oral anticoagulation and had intracranial bleeding, uh, bleeding and was lucky enough not to have severe neurological deficits. Um, this patient was sent for, referred from a cardiologist for um, um, left atrial closure with the Watchman device and you see here the standard procedure of course is to do a TEE to exclude left atrial thrombi and do the measurements of the left atrial osseum. Um, these are the 
basic um, 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 planes in around 45 degrees and 135 degrees. And you can see here, it's also an oval structure. So in one dimension, it's 18 millimeters, and in the other dimension, it's 21.5 millimeters. So according to these TE measurements, actually the sizing of the Watchman device would have been a 24 millimeter device. And this is the CT that was performed. You can see here clearly it's a chicken wing anatomy, which has been shown to have to be um, a more risky procedure, more difficult procedure. The ostium of the left atrial appendage is bigger than measured in CT uh, in TE, so it's 19 uh, times 30 millimeters. And um, in the context of research, so we're seeing more and more 3D printing. Um, um, but this was performed in the context of um, a research procedure, not in a clinical uh, setting. And uh, we decided on a bigger um, prosthesis according to the CT data. So that was a 27 Watchman device. And uh, the CT data was used to form a mold of the left atrial appendage. The 27 Watchman device was put inside here in the mold and scanned in CT. And you can see it quite nicely fitting here. So this is information you can get ahead. And uh, the patient uh, um, was referred for intervention and also using the CT for getting the angle that would give you the widest dimension of the left atrial appendage looking orthogonally here. This angle was used for implantation and the patient received a 27 Watchman device. So using the CT, similar to the TAVI procedure, you decide on bigger measurements. And actually, I don't have a slide here, but um, um, in December last year, there was a nice registry from coming from Australia that showed um, a similar data that using CT, you avoid having gross sizing errors and you end up in 50% of patients with bigger devices because of the clear anatomical details. So with that, I come to the last slides. I think we are very nicely using anatomy um, depicted in CT in clinical routine. So we started with coronary artery with diagnosis of obstructive heart, um, coronary disease. And we're using this diagnostic information for valvular chamber um, intervention for planning the procedures. I think it's a very valuable adjunct um, to provide recommended projection for implantations to adequately detect the size, whether it's annulus size, paravalvular leaks, or the chamber size, to optimize intervention in certain cases for follow-up. And I think in the next coming years, we'll have more information as far as 3D printing, which is sort of like um, individualizing the intervention and treatment for patients. Thank you, Mohamed. This was a truly a, an excellent overview of the topic. So I think we have time for one more uh, question. And this question might be actually a good one, basically, to conclude is, uh, what is actually the, the, the longevity of these, of these valves, of the TAVI valves? What the data, what, what the data shows us? So I think this is a little bit away from the imaging, but I think we have now, um, um, from registry data, um, relatively long-term data, so somewhere between five and 10 years with very good results. So um, very comparable to um, surgical procedures. And I think this will make even TAVIs, as well as imaging for TAVI, even more important in the clinical arena. So this is one point. And the other point is we're seeing also data that shows us that using by implanting those TAVI prostheses, we're not implanting smaller valves. We're rather implanting bigger valves, which is very relevant. So in the clinical routine, you see, still see patients with patient prostheses mismatch. So the feeling that with, because of the surgical prosthesis with debulking, you're implanting bigger prostheses, this is not true. So data clearly show that in TAVI procedures, you actually implant bigger prosthesis than surgical valves. So this, um, um, and the long longevity is, um, has been shown in relatively long-term data uh, yes. to be quite good. Yes, and it's, it's especially important since the field is moving towards uh, intermediate risk patients. Yes, so it's, uh, that's exactly the, yes. because the, the durability of the valve, we're seeing data going to this direction. Yes, thank you. I think we have to conclude. So now we are approaching the end of the webinar and I would like to close this session by reminding some take-home messages for your daily practice. So as we learned, TAVI is for patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis and unacceptable surgical risk. The precise aortic analysis assessment is crucial, as Mohamed taught us, to, and it's important to choose the appropriate prosthesis site. Optimal fluoroscopic projection comes for free, basically from CT images, shortens the procedure times, reduces the amount of contrast agent and the x-ray time. So CT assessment of vascular access point is of great help to choose the safe implantation route. So taking this together, 
CT imaging helps to minimize the risk of short and long-term complications of structural heart disease interventions. So it's not only TAVI, but all the other modalities which uh, Mohamed nicely presented us. We will now close the webinar and thank you, Mohamed, for this excellent and very interesting presentation. We hope you enjoy this time with us and you will be able to view again this webinar offline in a few days on the ESC website. Thank you.